go on a little long. I think it was quite important to let Bernard go on a bit long there. This is, as you can see, a really significant contribution to our knowledge on this subject. I mean, you can hardly be, you can hardly think of a more significant contribution. So I think you know an extra ten minutes there, especially to look at the the methodology behind it, which is what uh, some of some of um, you know, once you have a really important thing to say, you do begin to look at how, how, how you've come to that conclusion. In general, so far, all the things I've thought of to criticise Bernard has got fairly good answers to. So it'll be interesting to see what, um, what everyone here has to say. But first, let's ask Alison uh, what uh, she makes of it. OK, thank you very much. And thank you for that, Bernard. It, it really, truly is a, a remarkable feat um, in many respects. And having been involved in a lot of big evaluations in my time, and this is kind of bigger, than anything I've been involved in. I am, you know, um, in awe of your what you've put together. And I do think there are some important sort of standard setting features of this evaluation, which I do hope you'll spend some time, you know, communicating more broadly aside from the particular findings, not least things you pointed to around its governance, its inclusiveness, which is really quite remarkable. Um, but also this commitment to um, uh, independent verification of the quality of the evaluation and you actually had an independent evaluator evaluate the evaluation which I think is you know a neat uh, exercise and one that I've asked uh, in my blog on the new aid impact commission here in U the UK that they keep an eye to evaluating the evaluators uh, uh, as part of the process of maintaining independence so all that's good I would say just as a very general point and I don't mean this facetiously at all but I found the synthesis report very unnerving. I couldn't find a number in it. And I know that this is a synthesis. I know that this is a coming together of a whole you know, complex uh, web of country and thematic and agency specific evaluations. But it felt, as I read through it, that this was kind of evaluation by, a, by adjective. Everything was some little substantial mod moderate. Now, I know, I mean, I've you know, lived the evaluation community for a long time, and I know those adjectives have meaning. I think we need, to <laughs> we need to commit to being clear about what we mean. What the heck does moderate mean in this context? You know, what are we really uh, uh, committing to in terms of our scale uh, of, of evaluative judgment? And, and the reason I found that unnerving is the, is, the, is the possibility of ever so slightly slipping the meanings. Because there is a very interesting table in the synthesis report, table three, which is called Summary of Aggregate Contributions to the Development Results Analyzed. And this is quite an interesting table because it tries to sort of map out this interesting exercise in the evaluation to try and trace through, uh, or I should say trace back from development results. Uh, a, whether or not aid has made a contribution, and B, whether or not uh, better aid practice has had any uh, influence in the way that contribution is made. And it's a very interesting table. But it's also sort of um, very difficult to get some sense of what some of the adjectives mean. So when we look at progress achieved, there's references a lot to some little, little sum. I don't really know what that means. Um, contribution of aid, some substantial, some little, little, some. I don't really know what that means. And then when you get to contribution of aid reforms, again, the same sort of language. But then you look at the summary uh, paragraph in the executive's summary about it, and it says significant positive contributions have been made to development results. How do you get from some little, little sum to significant positive contributions? And this is my problem, where we've got no hard data in the sense of numbers to say it's this big and this much and therefore this is how we evaluate it. And I just think we're sort of plagued a little bit in these types of evaluations by a real uh, a challenge of saying exactly what some of these adjectives mean in reality. So that's a, just a general point. And I'm, I'm not saying there's a simple answer. I'm just saying it's, a, it's an unnerving part of, of, of the overall synthesis. In terms of the findings, um, and of course, there's no simple way of summing up these findings. <coughs> they're very broad, they're very wide ranging, and, and uh, in some cases, some of them are quite interesting and new. If I was to caricature the core findings, I would say, well, there's a very clear statement that the aid partnership is significantly different today than it was 20 years ago. Different, but not necessarily better. Better in some places, but not everywhere. But it's different. 
And that within that, the Paris Declaration has been effective in essentially raising the price of poor aid practice and partnership by strengthening agreed norms and standards. By raising the price, as it were, of bad behavior, you don't eliminate it, you just make it more costly. But actually, you can still have lots of it as agencies basically make the judgment, well, we'll continue in our old practices anyway, and we'll pay the price that's essentially imposed on us by the community. But essentially, that's what these norms and standards are doing. They are, at the margin, raising the price of bad behavior. What's particularly interesting is that partner countries appear to have, although they were relatively late to the party, as it were, on the Paris Declaration, have actually now steamed ahead in terms of taking forward much of the spirit and the principles behind it. And there's some very strong statements in the, certainly in the executive summary, about the fact that the evaluation finds that countries have employed and embedded the declaration style improvements, not just to uh, manage aid better, but because they serve the country's national needs for such things as better public financial management, public procurement, and so on. However, the picture on, on and I should say this, evalu this phase two evaluation is much harder hitting on the donor side than phase one was, I think, and I think that's to be welcomed. But in terms of donors and multilateral agencies, um, the picture is actually fairly devastating. And there's a sentence which says, donor agencies have done significantly uh, worse or less well due to a lack of coherent policy structures, a focus on compliance and risk averse, a risk averse culture, over centralization of agencies, of donor agencies and systems, decisions running contrary to alignment with country systems, disconnects between corporate strategies and the aid effectiveness agenda. That is devastating. This is the donor club that came up with these rules of the game. Aside from the larger campaign, which I know was not a construct of this donor club, but this is the very donor club that came up with these rules of the game, and they are flouting them. That is devastating, in my view. And I'll come back to why I think then the recommendations may not actually fit that, conclude, that, that finding as well as they might. There's a wonderful bit of understatement in the report, in my view, which says, uh, with a number of striking exceptions, donor agencies have so far demonstrated less commitment than partner countries to making the necessary changes in their own systems. Most donor agencies have set high levels of partner country compliance as preconditions for their operations, and now I'm using my own language, rather than sorting themselves out. Blimey, this is, this is incendiary stuff. And I hope it's taken as being just this, you know, I think, you know, you need to put a few more of these big, impactful words, um, Bernard, into your presentation, because this is devastating stuff. Um, I do have some concerns, um, aside from my sort of the lack of numbers, which I, you know, take, you know, take that in a sort of relatively lighthearted way. I think um, that the evaluations at pains to recognize that there's been a huge amount of kind of white noise in the system in and around the Paris Declaration. Hence this reference to the campaign. <coughs> I don't know what I feel about that. I haven't decided. You quite like that language. I'm not sure I do quite so much. But anyway, but it kind of brings in all these different things that have been going on, not least major proliferation in this time. Sorry, Massive major? Proliferation. proliferation. Massive proliferation. New agendas working their way into the discourse, South-South Corporation, Trilateral Corporation, much more stuff coming out of different constituencies who are not classically part of the DAC, but who are now beginning to develop their own discourse around aid effectiveness. There's new market style mechanisms in the mix, AMCs and the rest. There's new vertical vehicles in the mix. Uh, there's been a huge transparency push, only some of which, in my view, could you actually ascribe to what's gone on in Paris. A lot of that I'm looking at Owen here, who's there. A lot of that is from you know, highly energetic, impassioned people outside of this system pushing the transparency button. All that white noise, and I know it's recognized in the evaluation, but just seems to me to make it very, very difficult <laughs> to kind of net out what the Paris Declaration has contributed. And I think the evaluation does a really good job of trying to do that. But I can't help feeling that some of the changes, particularly in partner countries that are observed, are actually despite Paris, not in spite of it. 
finally, the recommendations. I mean, they, they really do point to things that I personally, you know, have committed to and feel strongly about. High-level political engagement, more shared risk management, stronger country-led me mechanisms, kind of yes, yes, yes. But I can't help thinking that if the, ob if the finding is that donors and agencies have really been so terribly non-compliant uh, with their own uh, framework, if you like, or with their own declaration, then is the conclusion to do more and better the right conclusion? Now, I can imagine, having again been involved in valuations, that you can't start an evaluation of something with the view that you want to, you know, that there's a possibility that the conclusion is that the very thing you're evaluating, you know, uh, essentially uh, needs to be uh, disbanded. That's really tough going. You can't, you know. But I, I do worry that the conclusions or the recommendations are simply stressing the need to go deeper, spend longer, focus more on 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 delivery against essentially a set of uh, uh, asks which are now of the past. That we have moved on. This all this stuff that's going on in the aid system is genuinely putting us in a different place. You cannot get there from here, in my view. And I think, you know, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't, this is not actually a criticism of the evaluation evaluation team. It's much more about whether or not there needs, the big political ask should be actually one of, let's find the one or two things that have been truly transformatory. Let's focus on those, junk the rest, and get on with finding a new discourse that is actually of the now and the future, not of the past. Right, well, thanks very much, Alison. That was very interesting as well.